optical surgery, we are arranging this operative neuroanatomy course. And today we are really honored to have Professor Wen with us from Sao Paulo. Professor Wen is head of epilepsy and member of vascular neurosurgery at University of Sao Paulo. He has also served as the co-clinical assistant professor at the Department of Neurosurgery in University of Florida. And today, Dr. Wen will be talking about the microsurgical anatomy of the temporal lobe. Thank you so much, Professor Wen, for joining us today. And floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon in Pakistan. Thank you very much, Hassan, for your wonderful words, kind words. And um, I thank all the organizing committee uh, the whole team behind this to make this possible. I'm very honored to be here talking to you guys. Um, you know, when we, um, we say we talk about anatomy, if we just talk about anatomy, it's kind of boring um, because we study anatomy as surgeons. We have a certain, a different purpose. We're not just anatomists. We want to use anatomy to apply it in our surgeries. Uh, we want to be better surgeons to do better surgeries. That's why we, we have to know the anatomy. Then, um, the second, um, we know that um, the temporal lobe presents four surfaces. One's lateral, one's a superior that is related to the sylvan fissure region. One is medial and one's basal, okay? But as I said, anatomy for anatomists is different from anatomy for neurosurgeons. So today I'm gonna talk about the um, um, anatomical aspect of the temporal lobe, mainly the sylvan fissure region that is uh, interesting, important for the neurosurgeons. One of the topic, oh, I, I don't like the, um, the talk that um, you know this the lecturer will be speaker will be speaking speaking and, and that's the tr direct transmission of knowledge. I hate that. I want to make especially young people. I want to make them think. They have to think. How can I use the anatomy in um, in the various situations? So, but uh, before that, I always um, I. I always like to acknowledge my mentors when uh, they all passed away. Dr. Rotem passed away six years ago and Dr. Vander passed away almost uh, one and a half years ago. Uh, they, they taught me how to see anatomy in a different way. And also um, they opened many years ago, they opened the, um, the door that led me to the wonderful world of microsurgical anatomy. And um, I think I, I owe them a lot. Well, what is the concept? How can I, as a young neurosurgeon, I would like to know how can I make, how can I become a very good uh, microsurgeon? So I have listed six solid foundations for successful microneurosurgery. First, you have to know anatomy not at anatomist, but as a surgeon. The second thing is you have, to, you, you have to have the capability of understanding the information prov provided by imaging and correlated with anatomy. Just by looking at MRI imaging or angiography and all kind of, this kind of things, imaging workup, and you say, oh, this lesion is located here. How can I approach that? What is the danger of approaching that lesion? Uh, lesion. This, the third thing is you have to be capable of planning the surgical strategy based on the anatomical and the radiological correlations. And um, four, capability of bringing together the anatomy, imaging, and pre-surgical planning into the surgery. And five, you have to have certain uh, surgical skill uh, through extensive training but after going to the lab, I have come to the conclusion that the, probably the best way to have a very good surgical skill is to perform frequently uh, microneurosurgeries. And also um, you have to have a good team of anesthesiologists, 
and you have to have adequate surgical instruments. We are not alone. We don't work alone. Um, just to make uh, my talk a little bit more interesting or less boring, I would like to, you know, to ask you many questions. Actually, I'm asking myself many questions. I have asked myself many questions. I have many questions in the past and still have many questions in the present time that I would like to answer. So I'll bring my questions to you. So you have to think and help me to solve the problem because you might be facing the future, the same problem. So I'm presenting you a case. MCA aneurysm from the left side. This is, there's aneurysm going on here. And this is lateral view and this is AP view. Um, so for instance, young guys like Asan, um, what would be your recommendation if you uh, have to do a surgery? What would you recommend to your uh, chief resident? What, why, where is the, be careful about this and why? And um, what would be your strategy? So the first thing that we analyze is like this. Where is the aneurysm? Aneurysm is, this one is located at, I would say at the genu Jenny of the MCA. Uh, for you to understand, you have to know what I'm talking about. What is the Jenny of MCA? And also, you can see this is, in this projection, we can see that aneurysm is pointing, the, the M1 is straight, aneurysm is pointing laterally. So what would be the recommendation of this? So where to approach if you have to open split the sylvan fissure. You go through the superficial part, you go through the deep part, you go through the left frontal side of the sylvan fissure, you go through the temporal side. So what 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 is the um, the strategy? So we gotta come back to this case in the end of my talk and I hope you will answer all my questions regarding this case. So and also you we will say, oh, you have um, uh, anatomical landmarks to approach this aneurysm. But we got a problem here. This is a um, the case, the patient had a somborachnoid hemorrhage. If you see this uh, very angry brain and the superficial landmarks are all gone. So it's sometimes very difficult to identify the, um, the, the anatomical landmarks with a brain like this. So we're gonna talk about this too later. But coming back to the uh, sylvan fissure, the sylvan fissure is located, it occupies two surfaces of the brain. One part of sylvan fissure is located on a basal surface. Another part is on a lateral surface. On the basal surface, both on the, on the basal surface or on the uh, lateral surface, sylvan fissure presents two parts. One is located on the surface, we call as a superficial part, and one part is the deep part. So let's talk about the basal surface first. First, So what would be the lateral part of the sylvan fissure? It's called what? It's called the sylvan fissure stem, which is this part. And if we go deeper, we're gonna go to the uh, enter surface of the insula. And also, where's the turning point from the surgical viewpoint? Where's the turning point between the basal surface and the lateral surface? Later on, we're gonna see that this turning point is better defined at the tip of the pars triangularis, okay? But on the superficial part, of the basal surface, we have the sylvan fissure stem and the neural the, the neural structures involved in this superficial part are the orb, orbital gyrite on the frontal lobe and the plenum pilari. Plenum pilari, we're gonna talk about this later, presents two parts. One is horizontal. We usually call it tip or pole of a temporal lobe. 
and the vertical part, which is a uh, vertical part of the plenum polari. We're going to talk about a lot about that later. But if we open the basal surface and go into the, the deep part of the sylvan fissure, we're going to see the content. The, the, the most important contents, content is the MCA, M1. Okay, you see the carotid artery over here? This is A1, this is M1. So we're going to see this. But if we remove the M1, we're going to see the neural structure behind it. So we can see this on the basal surface. What is the back wall of the sylvan fissure on the, bas on the basal surface? It's the anterior limit, it's the, sorry, it's the anterior surface of the insula. And this is the, the anterior pole of the insula. So what, what is this? The red dot, blue dot, this is the anteroperforated substance. And the blue dot will be the small veins coming down, coming out of the anteroperforated substance that this vein strains the basal ganglia. And the red dot are the perforators, the, um, the lateral or the medial um, lenticular striated arteries. They are branches of M1 and also branches of A1. And then M1 will be turning like this. So we have to keep this in mind. Another thing I would like to point out is this, what structures this that separates the uh, sylvan fissure, the insula, from the interperforate substance. Everybody says, oh, limit insula, limit insula. Have you ever seen limit insula in surgery? Limit insula means it's this. It's the limit. Limit means limit. Limit between the sylvan fissure stem, sylvan fissure cistern from the carotid cistern. We all know that anteroperate substance is the roof of the carotid system. So if a son asks his resident to, in a very a case like that, subarachnoid hemorrhage, swollen brain, a son will ask, oh, ask his resident, go first and drain CSF from the carotid system. What will be the, the tip that a son probably can give to his resident to how to locate it, locate the uh, carotid system. Sometimes it's not so easy. With the angry brain, swollen brain. One landmark that his resident can follow, sorry, can follow is just follow this olfactory tract. Follow this olfactory tract backwards because this is a very white, whitish structure very it's easy to recognize in the surgery so all you have to do is follow this olfactory tract backwards and it will lead it will lead you to the anterior preferred substance it will lead you to the carotid system that's where you can drain csf if you need so well if i re go ahead and remove the um this is posterior part of the lateral orbital gyrus. And this is the lateral, also the lateral part of the posterior orbital gyrus. So if I go ahead and remove the posterior orbital gyrus and part of the, the medial part of our posterior orbital gyrus, we're gonna end up in this situation. We're gonna see this part of the brain. What part of brain is this? This is the anterior surface of the insula. So the anterior surface of the insula is hidden behind the posterior orbital gyrus. What is the importance of this? Just memorize this and we're gonna, I'll have to ask you later in the surgery. So this is limit insula, the limit between the sylvan fissure system from the uh, carotid system. Okay, now let's move, let's now, uh, let's move to the lateral surface of the brain. You can see here, this is the apex of the insula, the most prominent part of the insula. It's not coincidence that it is always located right under the tip of the pars strangularis of the inferior frontal gyrus. 
why is this important? This is important because this part of the brain, the pars orbit uh, triangular is the most easily recognizable uh, landmark in the um, Sylvan Fisher uh, area. So this this one, this anatomical uh, feature plays a major role in our, how can we recognize neural structures intraoperatively, especially when the brain is uh, swollen and um, bloody and this kind of things. It's very difficult to recognize, but this part still uh, usually uh, very, it's possible to recognize this part. If you know where the, the tip of the pars triangular is, you know where the apex of the insula is. Apex of the insula is always on the second short gyrus of the insula. So you more or less know where you are in relation to, for instance, to insula. And also we're gonna talk about this later. The genu of the MCA is located just few millimeters, like a less than one centimeter proximal to the tip. So if you know where the tip of the, um, the pars triangular is in your surgery, you know where is the genu of the MCA, uh, you know where the apex of insula is located, okay? So where's the turning point transition between the basal surface to the lateral surface is in this area, the tip of pars triangularis. Okay. The superficial part of sylvan fissure on the lateral surface is very easy. We all know this is a pars orbitalis, triangularis, um, opercularis, precentral, postcentral, supermarginal, and on the um, and on the yeah, temporal side, it's superior uh, temporal gyrus, but this is the plenum, the vertical part of plenum polare, and this is then Hesch's gyrus, and then this is the, uh, post, uh, the plenum temporale. We're going to talk about that later. But if we, I, I, I remove the whole thing, I, I want to expose the insula. And we can see the branches of MCA. These are the M2 branches. My first question is, what do you think? Which trunk is larger? The superior trunk of MCA or the inferior trunk of the MCA? The answer is the inferior trunk of MCA usually, usually is larger than the superior trunk. And also, do you have any idea where the inferior trunk of MCA runs, it runs at the level of this sulcus. What does, what's the name of this sulcus? This, name, this sulcus is called inferior limiting sulcus of the insula, okay? And then if we follow the uh, MC, this is our M2, M2 are the insular segment of the MCA. If we follow M2 upwards, upward, upward, we can see that those branches at certain point will reach this region and then we'll follow the operculum of the frontal or the parietal lobes or the temporal lobe. So until here, oh man, until here, this is M2. From this, from, from the superior or inferior or anterior limiting south side of the insula, when it turns around the operculum, we call it M3. When it exits the sylvan fissure, we call it M4. So. These are some of basic anatomical concepts that we have to have in our mind uh, to start um, dealing with, for instance, MCA aneurysms. So once again, M1, M1 or the sphenoid segment runs on a basal surface. And then we have the genu, and then we have the M2 segment that are related to the insula. This is the, um, medial view of the same thing. I, would, I like to point out this is what? This is Hesch's gyrus or the anterior transverse temporal gyrus. This is what? This is the vertical part of plenum polare and this is the horizontal part of plenum polare. This is the vertical part of plenum polare, horizontal. What is the importance of this? This is no, what is, the, you, keep, you kept repeating those um, anatomical uh, structures, neural structures. Do you remember the first case, the very first slide I showed you? 
the M1 is straight, that aneurysm is located at the genu. The M1 is straight, pointing laterally. So guess what? To what neural structure the aneurysm, that aneurysm will be attached to? It will be attached to the vertical portion of plenum pilari. The aneurysm is here. Will you see when you start splitting the sylvan fissure? No, it will be hidden under. In a surgical position, this kind of aneurysm will be hidden by the vertical portion of plenum pilari. So what would be the strategy? The strategy, you remember, the GNU is a few millimeters, less than one centimeter proximal to the tip of the pars triangularis. So where is the pars triangularis in this slide? It's gone, but pars triangularis is over here. It's projected, project, projected onto here, okay? It's not here, but it's here, okay? And the genu is around here. So all we have to do is to recognize where the tip of pars triangular is in our surgery. We know that genu is like less than one centimeter proximal. And in that case, we know that aneurysm is attached here. So you don't go split the sylvan fissure and go towards the temporal side of sylvan fissure. No, you're gonna hit the dome, the fundus, of the aneurysm. So in this case, you find the pars triangularis, you go frontal, on the frontal side of sylvan fissure, get the proximal control, and avoid the dome of the aneurysm. That's the importance of knowing this anatomy. Let's go. When we deal with uh, aneurysm surgeries, we want to, to reach it as quickly as possible to establish the uh, proximal control. We want to avoid the, the dome of the aneurysm, and consequently, we want to avoid a, um, the premature rupture of the aneurysm. So we need to know the exact location of aneurysm and how to avoid the dome. This is my experience from 1996 to 2020. Um, in the beginning of my career, and still, uh, still now I have some questions, but um, in the beginning I, ha I had much more questions. I just could not understand the anatomy of this angiography. All I, I was searching for when I was young was uh, like a, a, um, the Anderson, like a little ball over here, over here, a hover over here. If I can recognize an Anderson, that's uh, already a glory for me. But over the years as a surgeon, you have to know uh, much more than that. So the one, this is one of the first slides, I, the dissections I made when I was in Gainesville back in 19, 1990s in Florida, Dr. Rothen's lab. Uh, I, I want to understand why, for instance, this is called the Sylvan Point. Where is, is it located? This is a Sylvan Point. What is Sylvan Point? Sylvan Point is the, the most posterior branch of MCA before, the last branch of MCA before exiting to the sylvan, from the sylvan fissure. So why is this branch straight? And why is this branch making such a curve? You know, what is, what, what is the, the first, what is the location of this first branch over here? I had a many, many questions. So to answer the first question, what is this one? This is located inside anterior limiting sulcus of insula. Okay, this is M2 segment. Medial to the M2 segment will be the insula. Lateral will be the temporal lobe or frontal lobe. Okay, sylvan point. The location of sylvan point is the, the most medial part of the Hesius gyrus. If, so if I know where the sylvan point is located, I know where the atrium is located. So if the atrium is over projected into here, what is the anterior wall of the atrium? Anterior wall of atrium, you have to know anatomy to answer this. Atri anterior wall of atrium is what? It's a povinar of the thalamus, parietal plexus, also cruce of the fornix. So can we have thalamus over here? No, no, no. From this line, anteriorly, 
thalamus over here, never here. Okay, the atrium is here. Okay, so another question, why is this uh, artery running straight? Because it is located at the plenum. Plenum means flat, plenum temporale. There's no, no uh, space for uh, artery to make curve. But in this case, why is this one making such a curve? Because it's located anterior to the hashes gyrus. So just by looking at the angiography, I know more or less where is the location of the lesion. So another question is, this is M2, right? This is inferior trunk, right? This is inferior trunk. So in what sulcus is this artery running? On what sulcus or in what sulcus? Inferior limiting sulcus of insula, okay? If you see this, what is the difference between this, uh, this artery and this artery? And why all of them will end up here? Is, there, this is, is it any special location over here? So anterior, this is uh, from the anterior cerebral artery, right? This is from the MCA. They will meet here. So what is, what is, the, what is here? This is the intraparietal sulcus. Okay. So where is the aneurysm? To what structure it is related, related or attached to? So let's see. This is carotid artery, carotid bifurcation. This is M1, A1. At a certain point, M1 will start turning to become M2, insular segment. So there is a transitional segment between M1 and M2, we call it a JNU. So let's, uh, for, um, for teaching purpose, let's say, for surgical, surgery per, surgical purpose, let's, uh, let's consider M1 as from the bifurcate, carotid bifurcation, all the way to the JNU. So this is M1, and from this point on, on will be M2. So if we divide M1 into one proximal half and distal half, we can, we can play some exercise and uh, we, we have to think about it. So M1 is here, proximal, proximal half, distal half. M1, proximal half pointing up. M1, distal half pointing up. What will be, Hassan, what will be your recommendation for your chief resident? Pointing up. Anderson from the proximal half of M1 pointing up, what is the danger? The dangers are this, the dangers is the lenticular right arteries. So it will be pointing towards the anteroperphyratus substance. Be careful. When you split sylvan fissure, go first to the temporal side of sylvan fissure to get the proximal control. Don't go to the frontal side because you, can, you might rupture the aneurysm before you are prepared for them. You have your proximal control. How about here, distal half? Do we have the same danger, same problem? No, we don't have lenticular striated artery here. This is the anterior surface of insula. Okay, so let's see. M1, this is a basal view, carotid bifurcation, A1, M1, genu. <clears throat> Distal half M1, proximal half M1. Aneurysm pointing up at the proximal M1. We'll be pointing towards the anteroperphyratus substance. Be careful with the lenticular striated arteries. Distal half, distal half M1 pointing up is related to here. What is this structure, anterior surface of insula, or the anterior uh, pole of the insula. So there's no lenticular striated arteries. But for both, both cases, avoid splitting sylvan fissure at the beginning from the frontal side of sylvan fissure. Go to the temporal side of the, um, the sylvan fissure. Get first your proximal control over M1, and then you proceed to the aneurysm, to the neck of the aneurysm. So to take home message, M1 segment pointing up, 
PPD is located at the M1 proximal half anteroperphetic substance. Aneurysm is related to the anteroperphetic substance. If aneurysm is pointing up, but arising from the distal half of M1, it is located at the enter surface of the insula. Okay, the same thing. M1, proximal half, distal half, pointing down. What would be your recommendation to your, uh, for your, the resident, chief resident? Okay, proximal half pointing down. What, is, what neural structure is, over, is located over here, just under the M1? Distal half pointing down. What structure is located here? We, we take a look over here. M1, proximal half pointing down. It is located to the uncus. So go, don't go there and retract the temporal lobe at the beginning of the surgery. And don't go dissect your sylvan fissure from the temporal side. Go from the frontal side. How about here? This still half pointing down. It is located to the horizontal part of the plantar pilari or the temporal pole or the tip of the temporal lobe. The same recommendation. Go split sylvan fissure from the frontal side. Don't retract the temporal lobe at the beginning of your surgery. To see proximal half pointing down, uncus. Distal half pointing down, the temporal uh, tip of the temporal lobe. So take home message for M1 segment aneurysm pointing down. Arising from the proximal half of M1, it is located to uh, related to the uncus. Uh, arising from the distal half of M1, it will be attached to the temporal lobe. Same exercise, M1, proximal half, distal half, aneurysm pointing anteriorly at the proximal half, aneurysm pointing anteriorly at the distal half. What are your recommendations for your chief resident? So, oh, sorry. Carotid A1, M1, genu, proximal half, distal half, Distal half pointing anteriorly, proximal half pointing anteriorly. The recommendation is careful with your craniotomy. But how come? Because those aneurysms pointing anteriorly on angiography, they are related, depends on their side. If they are big enough, they are related to the bone, to the lesser wing of the sphenoid, to the sphenoid bone. What we do in the, our craniotomy, we do the craniotomy. When we usually we, we bite off the sphenoid bone, either using ronjure or using a drill. But be careful because aneurysm can be attached to the dura and then consequently attached to the bone. If you don't be careful, you don't know, you are not aware of this aneurysm pointing anteriorly, it's related might be related to the bone, you might rupture the aneurysm during the craniotomy or even during a dura opening. So be careful. The take home message for aneurysm arising uh, to the M1, but pointing anteriorly, if it is located at proximal half or distal half, they are related more or less to the le lesser wing of the sphenoid. But if the aneurysm is pointing anteriorly, big enough, pointing anteriorly and up, it might be re related to the opercula of the um, frontal gyre, or if the aneurysm is big enough to point it anteriorly and down, you have to be careful also with the uncus or temporal pole. It's a um, misspelling here. Same thing, once again, M1, proximal half, distal half, pointing posteriorly, pointing posteriorly, proximal half, what the structure is located behind the uh, M1 at the proximal M1, uncus. What structure is located behind the distal half of M1? Anterior pole of the insula, okay? Take home message, M1, aneurysm rising from M1, pointing posteriorly. Arising from proximal half of M1, it will be attached to the uncus. Aneurysm arising from distal half of M1, it will be uh, attached to the insular pole. 
Okay. Very specifically, this transitional portion from the basal surface and the lateral surface of a sylvan fissure of the, the M1 into M2 is called genu. This is transition. So let's see. Take a look over here. What neural structure is located lateral to this region it's right here? It will be like, will act like a wall. This wall has a vertical portion. We call vertical portion of the plenum polare, and the horizontal portion, which is the pole or the tip of a temporal lobe. So any errors arising from this region from the genu pointing laterally, it will be pointing laterally. For instance, if M1 is straight, the aneurysm will be pointing laterally. The aneurysm is like this. The aneurysm will be pointing like this, laterally and down. If the curve is like this, the aneurysm will be pointing laterally and up. So what is the um, common place? It's laterally. So if the aneurysm is pointing laterally, it, is, it will be attached to the vertical portion of the plenum polare, okay? So don't go and split the sylvan fissure from the front, the temporal side of sylvan fissure. Go and split from the frontal side of sylvan fissure to get the proximal control, and then you attack the aneurysm. So this is, uh, once again, this is a vertical portion of the plenum polare. This is horizontal portion. Aneurysm arising from A1 to the genu, and the pointing will be pointing laterally. It will be always uh, attached to the, um, the, the plenum polare. We will see it and when you uh, start splitting the sylvan fissure. No, because it was because of surgical position, this kind of aneurysm will be hidden, and will be hidden by the vertical portion of plenum polare. So where's the aneurysm now? You know where? Uh, just by looking at an angiography, you know already. You know you already know where the location of the aneurysm is. So the next step is, where is this same aneurysm in my surgery? So many years ago, when I was um, in Florida, I made this dissection. But the purpose was just to show the anterior limiting sulcus of the insula, the um, the uh, the posterior orbital gyrus the tip of pars triangularis in the insula. And the, I thought it was very beautiful. But um, many years later, I was watching, looking at this slide and uh, I said, wow, there's a very nice relationship between the genu of MCA to the tip of the pars triangularis. Pars triangularis is the most easily recognizable anatomical landmark in the perisylvian uh, region. So if I know where the tip of part triangularis is, is located, I know where's the genu of the MCA. Why? That explained this. Um, well, any aneurysm, for instance, like this, or aneurysm arising from here. If I know where the carotid bifurcation is located, I know where this point is, is in my surgery. If I know where the tip of part triangular is located, and I'm here, I'm here. So in the beginning of the surgery, I'll ask my resident to split, to drain CSF from the carotid cistern. I just told you, you can follow the olfactory track backwards and we will, you will locate, it will be, uh, you will open the carotid cistern here. So I know where the carotid is. The next step, I know where the part triangular is. If the is here, I know that the is just right, very close to where I am, where the pars triangular is. So just go a little bit proximal, you will go to the aneurysm. Aneurysm is here. So this is more or less the halfway between the carotid and the pars triangularis. So by having this point and this point, I know we're along the M1 is the aneurysm located. That's how I do that.
So the take home message is that the par strangularity is just distal to the genu of MCA or the genu of MCA is just proximal to the tip of par strangularis. One very important concept, this is a modified picture from Professor Yashargo's book. In uh, during the angiography, we are like in the upright position, the patient's in the upright position. So for instance, aneurysm point like this red dot, red circle, red dot, aneurysm pointing anteriorly in the surgery, surgery patient will be in supine position. So anything on the angiography pointing anteriorly will be 90 degrees backwards. Anteriorly means in surgery, superiorly. Superiorly in, uh, on the angiogram means posteriorly in surgery. Posteriorly projected aneurysm in surgery will be projecting down inferiorly. Inferiorly projecting down in the angiography means anteriorly. So any, everything's 90 degrees backwards. If aneurysm is pointing up in surgery, it's going to be pointing backwards. So keep this in mind. Very important concept. Some exercise. Carotid bifurcation. This is aneurysm pointing down from M1. This is a genu. This is carotid bifurcation. So I would say maybe halfway between the proximal and half and the distal half of M1, maybe a little bit closer to the proximal half. But anyway, it's pointing down. So it will be pointing anteriorly in the surgery. If it is pointing down, means it is pointing towards the temporal lobe. So what we have to do is, um, if I know where I am, parse the tip of parse triangulars, I know where the carotid bifurcation is. I know that uh, the, this area is more, more or less midway between the parse triangulars and also the carotid bifurcation. And it's pointing anteriorly in my surgery towards the temporal lobe. So this is the uh, unruptured, this is the same case. So we can see this is the um, parse tip of parse strangularis. We know the genu is over here. The carotid bifurcation will be here. So the aneurysm is more or less halfway between the carotid bifurcation and the tip of parse strangularis. So once again, this is optic nerve, the same case, carotid artery, M1, aneurysm pointing towards the temporal lobe underneath the lesser wing of sphenoid. The tip of the um the tip of the parse triangular is over here. I didn't have to split all the way. I know where the energy is located, just go a little bit uh, anteriorly uh, proximal to get the proximal control over here. This is already distal to the origin of energy. This is the neck of energy. And this is the clipping. Always be aware that um, there's always a bifurcation of branch. You have to check if energy is big, clip, and then you will have to check um, the, uh, the those branches involved. Another case e exercise, you see the hydrocephalus over here. The blood is inside the uh, temporal horn, also over the atrium, inside the atrium. There's something over here. So this is um, CTA. You can see. It's a probably spasm of left carotid artery, left M1. This is a genu. So proximal half of M1 pointing down. Guess where the energy is located? We just talked about this. Pointing down means also he has a um, he had um a PCOM energy. So we're talking about this energy, MC energy, pointing down, proximal half. It is located at Ancus. Well, this one is located related to the Ancus. So this is um, this is the uh, the left side parse tip of parse wranglers over here. We don't have to see the uh, whole video. Let me stop here. Tip of parse wranglers over here. The genu is probably is over here. Carotid bifurcation is over here. That aneurysm is over here, the uncus, just lateral to the carotid artery.
we go just to the um, to the aneurysm. You see, this is M1. This is carotid. This is uh, optic nerve. This is carotid. This is M1 proximal. This aneurysm is attached to the uncus. Uh, I have uh, uh, clipped the aneurysm, but you have to check. You have to check the involved. There's no aneurysm arising alone. There's always a bif bifurcation. So you have to, you see, I saw, oh, this might be the neck, but you can, this is uncus. You can clip the aneurysm, but um, you still have to see We clip the aneurysm, and then we have to check if something else has been uh, clipped. And see, this is the inferior trunk that has been included in the clip. So we have to adjust the clip to, to clip just the aneurysm, not the superior inferior trunk or this kind of things. Okay, this is just to show you that Aneurysm arising from M1 pointing down is located, it's attached to the uncus. Okay, let's stop this. So once again, carotid, this is a picture. This is the um, optic nerve. M1, genio is over here. This is aneurysm, very ugly one. Another exercise, aneurysm arising from, this is carotid, A1, M1. This is um, genu. So this is proximal M1 pointing anteriorly. What is the recommendation? Be careful in your craniotomy, okay? Where dura opening, this aneurysm might be attached to the, the sphenoid bone or to the dura. So once again, right side, you see this is tip of bar strangularis. Let's go back. You see, this is a part strangularis, okay? Tip of part strangularis over here. This aneurysm is very uh, proximal, but it's pointing anteriorly in surgery. So how is it gonna be in, in, in point anteriorly in the angi angiography? So how is, how is it going to be in surgery? Anteriorly means upwards. Upwards means Aneurys in the dome of aneurys is facing you towards is directed toward you, pointing at you. Be careful. So if you split the sylvan fissure proximally, very uh, at the superficial part of sylvan fissure, you might rupture the, the dome of aneurys. So my recommendation for this kind of case is just go split a little bit superficial, but don't and then go down. Go down to get to the this part of the aneurysm first, instead of going superficially. So right side, par strangularis, bifurcation. This aneurysm is much more located in this area. So we see here, this is the uh, M1. Perhaps we'll go deep. We don't, the aneurysm is over here, very close to the bone, very close to the superficial part of the sylvan fissure. So we have the, the M1, we have the, the superior trunk and then inferior trunk of bifurcation of the inferior trunk. And there's the neck of aneurysm over here. You see, this is aneurysm. This is proximal control, superior trunk, inferior trunk. Another exercise, M1, proximal distal, halfway between the proximal and distal M1, pointing maybe a little bit up. If it is pointing up, it is might be related to the anteroperforated substance, the anterior right arteries, and also to the anterior surface of the insula. This is part tip of part strangularis, carotid bifurcations over here, more or less in here. You see, carotid artery, this is M1. Aneurysm is pointing toward the frontal side. 
after clipping, you have to always check the involved arteries. So let's come to the, the very first case I showed you this morning. Um, the M1 straight aneurysm is located at the genu. So we saw that, that in this kind of case, the aneurysm is always attached to the vertical portion of the plenum polari. So in that case, so this is the tip of plenum, tip of the parastrangularis. Carotid bifurcation will be here. This aneurysm will be here because it's located at genu. Genu is just a few millimeters proximal to the tip of parastrangularis. So I'm betting the aneurysm is here, but it's pointing laterally. So it means it will aneurysm will be hidden by the temporal lobe. So it should be here. So let's go. So we start splitting the, the sylvan fissure. It's a sharp dissection. Um, and then we go quickly to now in, in dissecting, the aneurysm will be the aneurysms will be here. You can see I already see the aneurysm. The aneurysm is attached. It's attached to the vertical portion of plenum polari. Because of surgical position, the temporal lobe will cover the aneurysm. The tip of par strangular is over here. So we the first thing you see is the attached, the dome of air is attached to here. Now in this case, I'm rupture one, so you can dissect even the dome, separate it from the, um, the temporal, the plenum, pola uh, plenum polaric, get the proximal control. This is superior trunk, inferior trunk is over here. Then you can clip the inners and, uh, with the, the uh, proper adequate um, clip. So this is just to show you how uh, we locate the aneurysm. One more case, you see this case? This uh, aneurysm arising at the bifurcation, uh, not bifurcation, at the um, genu of MCA. So the same, uh, same way of thinking, this might be very close to the uh, the plenum, the vertical portion of plenum polari, okay? But one thing, this is a lateral view. How about, this case is the same as the, the other case I just showed you, right? No, if you pay attention, this is a lateral, lateral projection. Aneurysm is, is at the genu, but it's very high, very far away from the carotid artery. Let's see the previous case. You see, this is lateral projection of that video I just showed you. Carotid artery over here. This is very close to the carotid artery. Now let's see the second case. And there's a raising from the, the genu of MCA. Lateral view, very far away. What is the meaning of this? What do they, the imaging are, tell, are trying to tell us? Very high means aneurysm is instead of buried, being buried, attached to the plenum polari, vertical portion of plenum polari, it is attached to the uh, frontal side. It's attached to the pars, the transition between the pars orbitalis and pars strangularis. It's attached to the pars orbitalis. So, um, very, we have to pay attention to the details. Microsurgery is all about details. And also the imaging is always telling us something. If you are not able, you don't know enough anatomy, you will not be able to catch the, the, all the information the imaging can offer you. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't see that. You didn't see that because you didn't know that. 
that's why you didn't see the unknown anatomy enough to understand the whole information that uh, imaging is trying to tell you. Okay, this is uh, another case arising from the journey of MCA, but this is a ruptured one. The very first case I show you, okay, this is the, uh, the, the status of the brain, the condition of the brain. So I'll bet the pars strangular is over here. This aneurysm, if pars strangular is over here, the aneurysm this, at the genu is just a few millimeters, one, less than one centimeter proximal to the, um, the pars triangulars. And also in that case, you see lateral view is very close to the carotid artery. So it, it has to be attached to the platinum pilari. So let's see. So I think the, the, the tip of our strangler is over here. So I put the spatula, I split superficially the sylvan fissure. I put the spatula, this is uh, M1. This is M1. This is a superior trunk. I have to see the aneurysm. and I know that aneurysm is attached to here. I not, this is a ruptured one. I cannot dissect the, the dome as I did in, other case, in, in the other case, in the previous case. This is the inferior trunk. This is the neck of aneurysm. So I, I'm not touching the dome. This is acute stage of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. So, so this is dissecting the neck, inferior trunk, superior trunk, proximal control, M1. Then I have identified all the elements involved to dissect, go, and then you go for clipping of the aneurysm without touching the dome. The dome is over here. But I already know that by looking at the angiogram. So this is a clipping. I just show some, I'm not showing very complex cases because we have to know the basic. And from the basic, we have to learn how to walk before learn how to sprint, how to run, okay? Um, for those who became interested in anatomy, uh, I strongly recommend you guys to read Dr. Rothen's book, wonderful book um, for those interested in the, um, just what I, I just talked to you about the uh, sylvan fissure region. We had a chance to publish this paper in, in 2009, neurosurgery. You can might want to take a look. And, um, you know, this aneurysm pointing up, down, and anterior, posterior, this kind of things. I had a chance to publish it in 2012. It's in English, not in Japanese. Don't worry. Japanese journal, but it's in English. Uh, also, we had a chance to to write write down something about the anatomy, surgical anatomy of the brain, from the fifth, sixth, seventh, and the current edition of the Yeoman's Neurological Surgery. I, I wrote chapter two in those four uh, editions, and uh, the eighth edition of Yeoman's has been uh, released this year, and um, before. Uh, when Dr. Vanda was sick, I stayed with him. I visited him every week. And um, I, I, I told him, young generation of neurosurgeons in the world, they have to know your work. And so I asked, I asked his permission and I had in, included 33 videos of, the, you know, he handpicked his best videos for me to put in this chapter chapter two, surgical anatomy of the brain. So I have included 67 videos among those 67, out of 67, 33 uh, uh, are videos handpicked by Dr. Vandre Oliveira. So if you access, you maybe buy a book or whatever, um, you can access, for instance, different um, examples, how you can apply the anatomy in the surgery, just as Video 65, transcavernous approach to the basal bifurcation aneurysms. Video 66, for instance, far letter approach to pica aneurysm and, and so on. So I would like to strongly recommend you to, if possible, to access um, 
Yeoman's uh, chapter two, not because of me, but because of uh, my my mentor, Professor Evander de Oliveira. Young generations must know his work. And um, once again, I thank you so much for your time, for your uh, kind attention to my my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.